as one Harvard professor is raising the theory this may actually be a piece of alien technology. According to renowned theoretical physicist Professor Avi Loeb, the comet is on an extremely unusual path. In March 2026, 3i Atlas is going to fly within 54 million kilometers of Jupiter, and we already have a spacecraft sitting right there in orbit around the planet that could theoretically intercept this thing and get the first ever close-up images of an interstellar object. And I'm not making this up. There's an actual published peer-reviewed paper by Avi Loeb showing the exact trajectory calculations proving it's mathematically possible. The thrust requirements, the fuel needed, all of it worked out. The optimal window was back in September and NASA didn't take it. But September was optimal, not mandatory. There are still possible trajectories that could work even now. They just require more fuel and less ideal positioning. So could NASA still pull this off? Let me show you what the math says. Chapter 1. The math that proves it's possible. So the paper was published in September 2025 in the journal Aerospace, authored by Avi Loeb from Harvard, Adam Hibbard and Adam Crowell. And it's not some speculative thought experiment. These guys actually ran the numbers using NASA's own trajectory software. They used something called OITS, which stands for Optimum Interplanetary Trajectory Software, plus SPICE, which is NASA's standard toolkit for calculating spacecraft positions, plus rebound for simulating orbital mechanics and they modeled exactly what Juno would need to do to intercept 3i Atlas at its closest approach to Jupiter. And here's what they found. On March 16, 2026, 3i Atlas will pass within 53.6 million kilometers of Jupiter, and Juno is already orbiting Jupiter right now in this highly elliptical orbit that swings way out to 5.8 million kilometers at its farthest point and then dips down to just 73,400 kilometers above Jupiter's clouds at its closest approach. And the cool thing about this orbit is that Juno is basically teetering on the edge of escape velocity, meaning it wouldn't take much of a push to break free from Jupiter's gravity entirely. The maneuver they calculated is called a jupiter oberth maneuver, and it works like this. First, you fire your engines when you're deep in Jupiter's gravity well at the closest point in your orbit, and because you're moving so fast at that point, any velocity change you make gets amplified by the gravity assist. It's the same principle as pushing a kid on a swing. You get the most effect when you push at the bottom of the arc, not at the top. So Juno would fire its engines to drop even deeper into Jupiter's gravity, pick up a massive amount of speed, then fire again, to redirect all that velocity toward 3i Atlas. And the numbers they calculated are wild. At Juno's periapsis, the closest point to Jupiter, the spacecraft is moving at about 58 kilometers per second relative to the planet. That's already insanely fast, but by firing the engines at this exact moment, you can convert a relatively small velocity change into a much larger change in orbital energy. The paper shows that the first burn would reduce Juno's orbital altitude slightly, increasing its velocity even more, and then the second burn would use all that built-up kinetic energy to fling the spacecraft out toward the intercept point. It's basically using Jupiter as a giant slingshot. The optimal date for the first burn was September 9, 2025, and the total velocity change needed would be 2.6755 kilometers per second split into two burns one at 2.1574 kilometers per second and another at 0.5181 kilometers per second. And if you do the rocket equation math using Juno's dry mass of 1,593 kilograms and assuming a specific impulse of 340 seconds for the hydrazine fuel, this maneuver would require burning through most of Juno's remaining propellant, but it's theoretically within the spacecraft's performance envelope. Now, the paper also shows there are alternative trajectories. If you miss the September window, you can still do it with a burn in mid-August or early September. And even if you're reading this now in late December, there are technically trajectories that could still work. They just require more fuel because you're no longer in the optimal position. The paper even calculated that with just 110 kilograms of propellant, which is only 5.4% of Juno's initial fuel mass, 
you could get within 27 million kilometers of 3i Atlas, and with more fuel, you could get even closer. So, mathematically it works. The trajectory exists, the fuel requirements are calculable, and we're not talking about some impossible science fiction maneuver. This is just basic orbital mechanics that we've been doing since the 1960s. Why September was optimal, but not the only window. So why was September 9th the magic date? It has to do with where Juno is in its orbit around Jupiter, and where Jupiter is relative to 3i Atlas, and how those alignments change over time. The closer you are to the optimal alignment, the less fuel you need to burn, and September 9th was the sweet spot where everything lined up perfectly. But here's the thing, optimal doesn't mean mandatory. The paper shows a whole range of possible launch windows spanning from mid-August 2025 all the way through mid-September, and each one requires slightly different amounts of fuel and produces slightly different intercept distances. If you launch on August 14th, you need about 3.3 kilometers per second of delta V. If you wait until September 9th, you only need 2.6755 kilometers per second, and if you go even later, you start needing more again because the geometry gets worse. And the reason there's a range of dates is because space missions always have flexibility built in. Launch windows aren't single moments in time, they're periods during which a launch is possible, and the same applies to trajectory correction maneuvers. As long as you're within a certain time frame, you can adjust the thrust magnitude and direction to compensate for non-optimal timing. The paper even discusses what they call a double impulse scenario, where instead of doing one big burn, you split it into two smaller burns at different points in the orbit, and this can actually save propellant if the timing works out right. So even if you missed September 9th, you could potentially use a double impulse strategy to make up for the less efficient geometry. Now we're in late December 2025, which is well past the optimal window, but the fundamental physics hasn't changed. 3i Atlas is still going to pass by Jupiter in March 2026, Juno is still orbiting Jupiter, and the trajectory math still works. The difference is, now you'd need more fuel than the calculations assumed because you've lost the optimal positioning and you'd need to recalculate the entire trajectory based on current positions and velocities. And this is where it gets tricky, because Juno's exact fuel reserves are classified. NASA hasn't publicly released how much propellant is left in the tanks after nine years of operations. The paper had to estimate, based on Juno's initial fuel load of 2,032 kilograms, and work backwards from all the maneuvers the spacecraft has performed since 2011. But without knowing the exact current fuel state, you can't say definitively whether a late intercept is still possible or if the tank is too empty. What we do know is that Juno has been operating on a shoestring fuel budget for years because its main engine failed back in 2016, forcing NASA to rely on much smaller reaction control thrusters for all orbital adjustments. These thrusters are less efficient and burn more fuel to achieve the same velocity changes, which means Juno has probably used more propellant than originally planned. What we could learn and why they should do it. So why would this be worth doing? What could we actually learn from a Juno flyby of 3i Atlas that we can't get from telescopes on Earth? First, resolution. Even our best ground-based telescopes, and even Hubble, can only see 3i Atlas as a fuzzy blob surrounded by its coma of gas and dust. We can measure the overall brightness. We can analyze the spectroscopy of the coma to figure out what gases are present. We can track its trajectory and look for changes in velocity, but we cannot resolve the actual nucleus itself. We don't know its exact size. We don't know its shape. We don't know if it's a single solid object or a rubble pile held together by gravity. We don't know what the surface looks like. Juno has a visible light camera called JunoCam that's taken spectacular close-up images of Jupiter's clouds, and from 27 million kilometers away, which is what the paper calculated as achievable with minimal fuel, that camera could potentially resolve features on 3i Atlas down to a few kilometers in size. Not enough to see surface details, but enough to determine if it's elongated like one i Umuamua, or roughly spherical, enough to see if there are distinct bright and dark regions suggesting compositional differences, 
enough to count how many pieces it's made of if it's fragmenting. Second, Juno has instruments that can probe beyond the visible. The microwave radiometer can measure thermal emission from the nucleus and tell us about subsurface temperature. The infrared spectrometer can identify specific minerals and ices on the surface. The ultraviolet spectrograph can analyze the composition of gases in the coma with much higher sensitivity than Earth-based UV telescopes. These aren't just prettier pictures, these are fundamentally different types of data that reveal physical properties we cannot measure from Earth. Third, Juno could detect things that aren't emitting light. The magnetometer could search for magnetic fields which would tell us about the object's internal structure and composition. The energetic particle detector could look for charged particles being released by the comet which might indicate active venting or even electrical activity. The radio and plasma wave instrument could search for any electromagnetic emissions. And if 3i Atlas were somehow technological rather than natural, these are exactly the kinds of signatures you'd want to look for. Fourth, we could measure the mass. By tracking how Juno's trajectory gets perturbed by 3i Atlas's gravity during the flyby, even from tens of millions of kilometers away, you can calculate the gravitational pull and therefore the mass of the object. Combined with size estimates from imaging, this gives you density, and density tells you what it's made of. Is it a loosely packed rubble pile with density less than water? Is it solid ice with density around 0.9 grams per cubic centimeter? Is it rock with density over 2? Is it metal with density over 7? This is information we absolutely cannot get from telescopes. And fifth, this is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. We've only ever identified three confirmed interstellar objects. One I Oumuamua showed up in 2017, and we didn't spot it until it was already leaving. Two I Borisov appeared in 2019, and we got decent telescope observations, but no spacecraft data. And now, three I Atlas. The next interstellar object might not show up for another decade, and when it does, there's no guarantee we'll have a spacecraft in the right place at the right time to intercept it. Think about it this way. We've been searching for interstellar objects for decades and only found three, which means they're either extremely rare or extremely hard to spot, or both. The fact that we happen to have a functional spacecraft in exactly the right part of the solar system at exactly the right time to intercept one is a cosmic coincidence that might not repeat in our lifetimes. Juno wasn't designed for this mission. It wasn't built to chase comets, it just happens to be in the right orbit at the right moment. This is our shot to actually touch something that came from another star system, to get close-up data from an object that formed in conditions totally different from our own solar system, to potentially answer questions about planetary formation and cometary composition that we can only study through examples. Every interstellar object we study tells us something about what's normal, versus what's unique to our solar system. And right now, our sample size is basically zero because we've never gotten close to one. So yeah, burning Juno's remaining fuel and ending its Jupiter mission early would be a sacrifice. But what you get in return is the first ever close encounter with an interstellar object, data that could reshape our understanding of what exists out there in the galaxy, and a chance to definitively determine whether 3 i Atlas is just a weird comet or something more interesting. Why NASA probably won't do it? So given that it's technically possible and scientifically valuable, why hasn't NASA pulled the trigger on this? First problem, Juno's main engine has been broken since 2016. The spacecraft was supposed to use this big main engine to adjust its orbit around Jupiter, but during a planned maneuver, the engine valves didn't work properly and NASA decided it was too risky to try using it again. Since then, every orbital adjustment has been done using the reaction control system, which are these tiny thrusters, originally meant for fine attitude control, not major velocity changes. And the maneuver to intercept 3i Atlas would require burning 2.6755 kilometers per second of delta, which is a massive velocity change, way beyond what the reaction control thrusters were designed for. Now, the paper assumes you could use the RCS thrusters to do this maneuver, and technically the math works. You just burn for longer and use more fuel. 
but NASA has spent nine years being extremely conservative with Juno's propellant budget precisely because they can't afford to run out of fuel and lose control of the spacecraft. Using almost all remaining fuel for one big maneuver is the opposite of conservative. Second problem, we don't actually know how much fuel Juno has left. The spacecraft has a fuel gauge, but it's not perfectly accurate, and after nine years of thermal cycling and vibration and micrometeoroids, impacts, there could be leaks or pressure changes that throw off the measurements. NASA's best estimate is based on tracking how much fuel was loaded initially and subtracting all the fuel used in every maneuver, but there's uncertainty in those numbers. The paper calculated that you'd need at least 110 kilograms for a distant flyby and potentially much more for a closer approach. But if Juno only has 80 kilograms left, then the whole plan is impossible. Third problem, institutional risk. NASA is currently facing massive budget cuts. The Trump administration has been slashing funding across federal agencies and NASA is not exempt. In an environment where every mission is fighting for survival, proposing to end Juno's highly successful Jupiter science mission early to chase an interstellar object that might just be a comet is a tough sell. If the maneuver fails, if Juno runs out of fuel halfway through, if the intercept distance ends up being too far to get useful data, that's a very public, very expensive failure. And failures get missions cancelled and budgets cut. And here's the thing. There was actually political pressure to do this. Congresswoman Anna Paulina Luna from Florida sent a letter to NASA on July the 31st, 2025, urging them to study the possibility of redirecting Juno to intercept 3I Atlas. The letter cited the AV Loeb paper and made the case for the scientific value of the mission. But NASA never publicly responded to that letter. There was no official statement about whether they'd considered it or why they rejected it. The whole thing just quietly died, which tells you something about how risk-averse the agency has become when even direct requests from Congress don't move the needle. Fourth problem, Juno is still doing good science at Jupiter. The spacecraft has been studying Jupiter's magnetic field, mapping the planet's gravitational field, analyzing the atmosphere, observing the auroras, and collecting data that's resulted in dozens of published papers. The mission was supposed to end in September 2025, but got extended because the science is still valuable. Cutting that short to redirect to 3I Atlas means losing all that future Jupiter data. And fifth problem, there's no guarantee 3I Atlas is interesting enough to justify the cost. Yes, it's an interstellar object. Yes, it has some unusual properties, but 2i Borisov was also an interstellar object, and it turned out to be a fairly normal comet, just one that happened to come from another star system. If 3i Atlas is similarly mundane, then burning Juno's fuel to fly past it doesn't teach us much that telescopes couldn't already tell us. So when you add all this up, broken engine, uncertain fuel reserves, institutional risk aversion, competing science priorities, and unclear payoff, it makes sense that NASA hasn't committed to the intercept. The optimal window in September passed without action. There's been no public announcement of any trajectory change, and the Wikipedia article updated just hours ago says it's unlikely Juno will be redirected. What will probably happen instead is Juno will observe 3I Atlas from its current orbit in March 2026 from a distance of 54 million kilometers. It'll take whatever images and spectra it can from that range which is better than nothing but nowhere near as good as a close flyby, and that'll be the extent of our spacecraft observations of this object. We had the chance to do something incredible, and we let the moment pass. So could NASA still intercept 3I Atlas with Juno? Technically, yes. The math still works. Trajectories still exist. Will they actually do it? Almost certainly not, and that's probably the right call from a risk management perspective but it's also a missed opportunity we might not get again for decades. Sometimes the safe choice and the right choice aren't the same thing. Don't forget to like and subscribe for more updates. Thanks for watching.